These days, so many podcast hosts just riff through unprepared segments until they get to the next ad break for pills they know nothing about, cheap razors, and whatever else they can get a buck from. But the Higher Side Chats does it differently. We succeed or fail on the quality of the content and your desire to hear more of it. So you're about to hear another free first hour episode that's here to prove the two hour shows are worth subscribing for. Five shows a month for just $8. Members get a mobile friendly website, a decade of archives, a dedicated RSS feed for the best podcast apps, and a lot deeper discussion than a single hour can allow for. Sponsor free with more for thee. Get a free seven-day trial of THC Plus at thehiresidechats.com. Enjoy! In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Let's go, Higher Side Chatters. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and if you do the digging, there is a wide range of cultures, old and new, near and far, that all have legends of a wide variety of very similar-sounding mythological or paranormal entities. From little green sprites and large hairy ape men to child-stealing witches and mischief-making spirits. The names change, but the descriptions are often so similar you have to wonder how the Irish, the Native Americans, the Japanese, and even New Zealanders all tell stories of being messed with by the same kinds of creatures going back about as far as anyone can trace. It's enough to make you wonder if we're even the apex predator on this island earth or if we might have beings living below the surface, deep in the mountains, or in some next-door dimension that see humans as naive playthings for when the mood suits. Maybe the veil was thinner in the past, perhaps cosmic arrangements trigger these overlaps, or maybe modern human consciousness is just too digitally distracted to catch the glimpses we sometimes do in less hectic environments. Well, however you look at it, one has to dismiss way too many eyewitness accounts and way too much cultural knowledge to say it all amounts to nothing. And someone who has a deep Rolodex of high strangeness stories is today's guest, Bruce G. Hollenbeck. Bruce grew up in Kinterhook, New York, a little Hudson Valley town steeped in strange history and folklore near the foothills of the Catskill Mountains. Not only has he and his family been a part of multiple multi-witness high strangeness sightings, but his new book, The Kinderhook Creature and Beyond, covers the history of paranormal activity in the area. And it's a lot. Bruce is not only an author, but also a screenwriter whose films include Vampire, Fangs, and The Drowned, and his many books on film history and pulp horror include The Hammer, comedy horror films, A Chronological History, Rock and Roll Monsters, The American International Story, and Poe Pictures. He has also written several other books in the cryptozoology field, including Monsters of New York, Monsters of New Jersey with Lauren Coleman, as well as Monsters of the Northwoods with William Brand, Paul Bartholomew, and Robert Bartholomew. Still living in upstate New York with his wife, four cats, and several ghosts, the Kinderhook cryptozoological chronicler and strange stuff historian, Bruce, welcome to the higher side. Wow, what an introduction. Hi, thank you very much. (laughs) I try, man. Yes, yes. It is a real treat to have you here. I really enjoyed the book. Not only do you go deep on the history of the Kinderhook area, but also the similarities between entities and creatures seen there with other things seen around the world. And you include a solid list of high profile, hard to misidentify epic UFO stories. And I guess to kick this off, let's give the people an overview of the landscape and the history of Kinderhook, because it's kind of a paranormal hotspot that I wasn't too familiar with. Yeah, it seems to be so. Basically, I guess relevant to this discussion, it's a very old village, one of the oldest in the country. Actually, Hendrick Hudson, when he sailed up the Hudson River, discovered it. And the name Kinderhook means children's corner in Dutch because he saw Native American children on the shoreline, and that's what he called it. 
since then, it's become famous for a certain amount of spookiness because Washington Irving wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow when he was staying in Kinderhook. For years, actually for centuries, the town of Terrytown, which is further south, and Kinderhook have always fought over who really has the rights to uh, the Sleepy Hollow story. And it turns out we both do, because what Washington Irving did was he set the story in Sleepy Hollow, which is Terrytown, basically, but he used the characters, he modeled the characters on people from around Kinderhook. And essentially, Ichabod Crane was a real person named Jesse Merwin, who was a school teacher. And Katrina Van Tassel was a woman named Katrina Van Allen, whose home is just down the road from where I live. So we've always had that kind of spooky atmosphere in Kinderhook. It's a great Halloween town, as far as I'm concerned. Of course, when I was a kid, I made the most of it. <laughs> Still do. Yes, yes. And that's just one <laughs> aspect of the wild stuff going on. This really should have been a Halloween show, but I guess we're doing like the Nightmare Before Christmas kind of thing. Exactly, and, uh, yes. <laughs> Apparently, Martin Van Buren, that's where his estate is. That's where he's buried. And there are a lot of ghost stories from the caretakers of that estate. Is that right? That's true. They don't want to talk about it, not in public anyway. You have to kind of get them, you know, aside when the tour groups are gone. And then they might tell you a few stories about how sometimes when they come in in the morning, in the estate is now a, a national historic site. They come in, in the morning and they find that they can smell something cooking in the old Dutch ovens, which haven't been used in probably 150 years. But it smells like there's something cooking there. People have seen spirits, shades as some call them, of Martin Van Buren and his sons on the estate, mostly outside, although there is one bedroom, bedroom of one of Martin and Baron's sons that is supposedly haunted. Sometimes they'll find the drapes have been taken down during the night, even though nobody was there, and they have to put them back up again. Little things like that that add up pretty quickly. Yeah, sounds like typical poltergeist shenanigans, but yeah. some places they just seem to be hot spots for this. Maybe they are places that preserve memories of repeated actions, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't strike me as an actual haunting. It's more like, a, you know, echoes of the past because there's never been anything there that's been malicious. There's never been any interaction with live people. It's sort of like you're looking at a movie of somebody, you know, walking along the path or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And another piece of lore that comes from Kinderhook is apparently the Rip Van Winkle story. Is that right? Well, it's near Kinderhook. You know, Kinderhook is near the, the Catskills. And of course, that Rip Van Winkle is also written by Washington Irving. And he wrote it around the same time as he wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And Rip Van Winkle, of course, is a classic story of little people, because the, the little people that spirit rip away into the woods are supposedly the ghosts of Henry Hudson and his crew, but they've apparently been shrunken down hmm. to minuscule size for whatever reason. But there is a connection, as we shall soon see, between so-called fairies and elves and the dead which I've always found very intriguing. Yes, absolutely. I'm right in that space, too. And the Rip Van Winkle story is really wild because for people who need a reminder, Rip is in the Catskill Mountains, stumbles into a man wearing clothing out of the time period. That's kind of a key thing that pops up in these stories. And he's carrying a keg, and he oddly knows Rip Van Winkle's name. Then Rip Van Winkle helps this guy get the keg to a larger group of strangely dressed men, and he drinks from the keg while they are partying and falls asleep and wakes up 20 years later. And as you mentioned in the book, this story structure is very ancient. In fact, it goes back to a first century story called The 70-Year Nap. But the theme of finding a strangely dressed person in a remote area who leads you 
to a larger group of those people, sometimes underground, and there's music playing, gives you food and drink, and it causes you to have a crazy spell of missing time, that is a story that's retold so many times you start to wonder if there's truth in it. Well, yeah, it's the classic fairy abduction story. And of course, the alert listener may may realize that it also bears a lot of similarities to alien abduction stories, which I also find very fascinating. The fact that there's missing time involved, I always thought was very interesting because back in ancient times, nobody knew anything about Einstein's theory of relativity or any of that stuff. And yet, the stories always say that time passes differently in fairyland or elfland than it does here. I always thought that was a very interesting detail. Mm -hmm. Where did they come up with that? You got me, but it's, you know, in the book, I say that I don't really have any answers to these questions. I just raise the questions. And it's up to somebody else to find the answers because I've had these experiences that I can't explain throughout my life. And what they mean, it's all up to interpretation. But I just find them fascinating and I I hope I continue to have them. <laughs> yes, yes. And let's get into your own personal sightings and experiences. Obviously, the book is called The Kinderhook Creature. Tell us about this creature and the experiences you and your family have had with it. Well, the full title of the book is The Kinder Creature and Beyond a Personal Reminiscence. And essentially, we're talking about, yes, a Bigfoot type creature, pretty much of the classic style, which I'm almost embarrassed to say because here we are in upstate New York. And I myself used to be skeptical of Bigfoot reports from this area because I started hearing them around the late 1970s. And there were some that were published in a, a magazine called the Hudson River Chronicle. And I thought, well, okay, interesting, but I, I have a hard time with Bigfoot in upstate New York. I mean, I can sort of believe it in, you know, the Pacific Northwest or in the Himalayas, but upstate New York, I don't know. Until <laughs> my family and I started having our own experiences. And that started around 1979. When my grandmother started noticing, and she lived in, actually, in the house I'm speaking from now, which is, you know, a country house, got seven acres of land right on the edge of the woods. And she noticed that something was taking her trash bags off her back porch. And it was taking them down into the middle of the yard, untying them, going through the foodstuffs and taking all leftover food out. Now, a raccoon or a bear, for example, would not untie a trash bag. They would just tear it apart, and there'd be a mess all over the lawn, but there wasn't. It was pretty neat. It's just that it took what it wanted and left. And it turned out that a neighbor, a woman who lived across the woods, had reported that her trash bag was taken and hung up in a tree. So this was all pretty strange, but my grandmother didn't tell anybody about this for a while until my cousin Barry, who at the time was a teenager, was trapping and, and hunting in a, a nearby swampy area called Cushing's Hill. And he came back to the house one day, to my grandmother's house, and I was here. And his face was as white as a sheet. <laughs> and he said he had just seen three two-legged creatures walk across the creek and they were making clacking and grunting sounds. Uh, they had reddish brown hair or fur. And this was in broad daylight, by the way. So, you know, <laughs> right away, I, I went down to the swamp with him and we looked all over the place. We couldn't find any tracks of anything, but he was terrified. And he had a baseball bat in his bag that he was carrying in case he you know, came up with any strange critters, but he figured that that would not be any match for what he saw. So I didn't know what to think at that point. I didn't think he was lying because he was genuinely scared. And there were several incidents that kind of built up 
to the major one in the book, which I'll get to in a minute. The next time I remember really feeling strange that something weird was around, I had a friend visiting from England, and she was visiting our house, and she was staying at another place up in Kinderhook. And one evening, I this was in the summer, I took her out to walk up to where she was staying with her. And just as we got out on the back porch of my grandparents' house, I heard this incredible, ungodly noise coming from the woods. It started out as a shriek or a howl, kind of went into a series of guttural sounds, and then kind of died out in a low moan. And my English friend looked at me and said, is that a typical American sound to hear at night? And I said, nope, (laughs) (laughs) never heard that one before. (laughs) And I wasn't about to go into the woods at that hour. I mean, it was dark and that sound just did not make me want to go towards the thing. So I didn't investigate then. I kind of wish I had, but it all came to a head a couple of months later in September when I was out visiting some friends in the evening, and I got a call at the restaurant where we were dining and having a few drinks, and it was from my grandmother, and she said, please come over here. There's something outside the house. I don't know what it is, but it's making a horrible noise. I'm scared to death, and I thought, well, that's really strange that she would call me here at the restaurant to tell me that. I mean, she was not the type to be afraid of anything. So I got in my car, and it took about 10 or 15 minutes to get home. But by then, I'd missed all the excitement. turned out that my Aunt Barbara had brought my grandmother home from her house. And just as my grandmother had gotten out of the car, they heard this horrible noise from around the shed in the back of the house. The noise was, she said, like somebody moaning or groaning almost like a person in pain, except that it went on and on and on. And it had a series of different noises mixed in, and that sounded a lot like what I had heard. Then my grandmother decided to go in the house, and my aunt decided to go back and get my cousin Barry, who had a shotgun. And so she brought him back, and he stood out on the back porch. He couldn't see anything, but he shot up into the air. And whatever the thing was, it screamed, he said. And he shot up in the air a second time. And this time he said, flame came out of the barrel of the gun. And the thing screamed and ran off. Although he felt that there may have been more than one. He thought there were maybe two things that ran off. So by the time I got home, this was all over. (laughs) It had been scared away by, by the gunfire. And when I talked to my grandmother, she said that, First of all, it was a really big full moon that night. I remember that very vividly. The moon was like the size of a basketball in the sky. And she said she could see a shadow around the corner of the shed of whatever was making this noise. And she said it was very tall, had long arms, and sort of a conical-shaped head, almost a pointed head. And I thought, well, that's a classic Bigfoot description, isn't it? So that was kind of the beginning of (laughs) a lot of activity here. My mother had heard, I should say my parents live about a quarter of a mile down the road. And they had heard a lot of the activity. They heard the gunshots. I guess they heard some of the screaming. So my mother wrote a letter to the Albany, New York newspaper, the Times Union. There was a columnist there named Barney Fowler who wrote a column about the outdoors. And he published the letter, and he also asked his readers if they had heard anything similar or encountered anything similar to this. And shortly after that, he was deluged with letters from people all over Columbia County and neighboring counties saying that they had either seen or heard similar things. These strange noises they couldn't account for. One woman had a sighting, which was very impressive. She said that she was driving home from Albany one night, and 
this large ape-like creature crossed the road in front of her. And she said it was seven to eight feet tall, had reddish brown hair. Its arms were swinging, she said, gracefully. And she said it looked like a highly evolved ape. And it walked off into the cornfield across the road and disappeared. So you had sightings, you had, you know, vocalizations, all kinds of weird things going on. And so Barney Fowler's column was, <laughs> it got to a point where he finally had to call a halt. He said, okay, I think we've overdone this. We'll get on to some different topics now. <laughs> but it was pretty amazing that how many people responded to that. Yeah, I love it. And just the wide range of accounts within your family add a lot of credibility to it. Multiple people seeing it at one time. Mm -hmm. Then there's a story of your grandma seeing it curled up outside her window yep. one time. And this is going on over a time period of a couple of years, I suppose. Yep. When was the last time anyone in your family heard or saw something like this? Well, in my family, it was probably, it's been a while. I would say around the end of the 80s or so. So that's, you know, it's been about, I guess, 30 years. Damn. Doesn't seem possible, but there it is. Why that is, I don't know. You know, I had a theory for a while that my cousin shooting off his gun might have just, you know, scared it out of the neighborhood. I don't know. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is a lot of, building going on in this area. A lot of houses have gone up since then. So, you know, if this thing is a natural creature of some sort, a biological creature rather than some sort of paranormal entity, this breeding ground, if you will, is kind of vanishing. I mean, it's not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that may be part of it. I don't know. There have been a lot of sightings and vocalizations south of us, however, in Dutchess County, which is the county just beneath Columbia County. And I have a feeling maybe it just kind of moves south. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's totally <laughs> possible. And there's even some stories from 1982, just a couple years after this kind of peak experience in your family of white Sasquatches in the area. So that's strange. But I've mm -hmm. heard you talk about these stories on other podcasts. And I've heard you say that you tend to lean towards the conclusion that it is just some kind of physical creature or animal. As odd as it sounds, I think that's the least likely explanation because we never can seem to recover a body. No one who encounters it is ever able to shoot one or kill one. Mm -hmm. Maybe they bury their dead. That's brought up in the book. But oftentimes when people see these things, they just vanish. They either take a few steps and dissipate or they just can't see it go away. The really weird things tend to happen. And again, maybe it is like not seen anymore because of the building in the area. Maybe it's just not that it's its natural habitat, but just you don't see these things if you're not embedded in nature, perhaps. Mm. Maybe it lives underground. That's another theory I've heard proposed. Mm -hmm. But really, when you get into the details of these stories, it's so strange. I can't imagine it being a, a real physical creature. Well, you know, I go back and forth on that. And as I say, I, I don't really come to any actual conclusions. I mean, I, I tend to think scientifically. But on the other hand, there have been some experiences that I've had with these things that don't add up physically. For example, the tracks that I found in the snow that ended in the middle of the field. Yeah, yeah, there um, you go. That I can't really explain unless, I mean, a flying Bigfoot is too much even for me. So it's, <laughs> uh, does it disappear into another dimension? I don't know. But I did have an experience in 1982 in which I went to this location, which we dubbed Bigfoot Bridge because a number of tracks were found underneath the bridge by a hunter. And I made plaster casts of those. So it seemed to be a hot spot. So I decided one night to just, on the way back from work, I was working in radio at the time, and I, I decided on the spur of the moment just to go over to Bigfoot Bridge and just, you know, sit there for a while and see if anything happened. 
which was kind of a dumb idea because I didn't have a camera. I didn't have a tape recorder or anything else. But I just, I don't know. It was a spur of the moment thing. So I parked the car and turned out the lights. And it was a, kind of a spooky night anyway. I mean, there were, <laughs> on the way over, a black cat had crossed my path. So I should have known something was up. Uh-huh. But, you know, it was a very quiet night at first. And then I just kind of decided, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to count to 100. And by the time I reach 100, if nothing happens, I'm going to go home. So I was getting up into the 80s or 90s, I think, when I heard a sound from this little group of trees across the road, which to me sounded like two big monkeys <laughs> trying to talk to each other, chattering. And I really wanted to get out of the car. I really did. But my legs wouldn't cooperate at first. <laughs> so I admit I was a little scared about that. By the time I finally got up the nerve to get out of the car and go across the road, the noise stopped. That was predictable, I suppose. But at the same moment that the noise stopped, I saw ahead of me there was, far in the distance, a light coming up from behind the trees. Just a white light. And it went straight up into the sky and just disappeared. Now, what the connection was, I don't know. <laughs> Hmm. Or was there a connection? But it's another one of those things I can't explain. Yeah. And, you know, the Kinderhook creature, it gets top billing in the book title, but there are far stranger sightings that you've had, including this, I guess, thing that was seen multiple times that you just call the blob. And the depictions of it in the book are really wild. They kind of look like, uh, ghost like in an old mickey mouse cartoon an old black and white cartoon or it looks like a floating bowling ball yeah. with a sheet over it yeah. to a degree yeah but this is strange talk to us about this it is very strange back when i was nine or ten years old my cousin sherry that's barry's sister she and i were playing in the woods at the top of the hill in the, behind the house and it's a lot of woods there and it was just before sunset, and I heard this noise like a high-pitched whistling sound. And I turned around, and I saw something that seemed to be looking at me from behind a tree, even though it had no eyes. I said it was looking, because I felt it was looking at me. And it was just this big, bulbous, bluish-white shape. I likened it to Casper the Friendly Ghost, speaking of cartoons. <laughs> and... I was so startled by this apparition that I I said to Sherry, let's get out of here. And we just ran down the hill and didn't look back. So that, you know, I kind of chalked that up to, okay, that was a weird thing that happened in my childhood. But two years later, a friend of mine, actually my best friend when I was a kid, it was this kid named Jerome. He was down in the woods by himself. He was doing something down there, and I was up at the house. And as I was coming out the door, he came running up to the house saying that he had seen something that scared him so much down in the woods that he had jumped over a pond. And the pond was close to six feet wide, as I remember. And he said it was, he called it a blob. And it came down the hill towards him. He said it kind of floated down the hill. So. I wasn't sure if he was pulling my leg or not. <laughs> it didn't look like he was because he looked like he was really scared. So, you know, being a 12 year olds, we decided, okay, we're going to find this thing. And I took a pitchfork and he took some other farm implement of death. I don't know what it was. <laughs> and we went down in the woods to see if we could find this thing. And, you know, we were walking through the woods together and then all of a sudden he stopped. And he pointed ahead. It was like he couldn't say anything. He was too scared. He was pointing toward this tree. And I looked at the tree. And there, sure enough, there was something up in the tree that was like a white shape. And being 12 years old, we were incredibly courageous. So I said, let's get out of here. And we dropped our weapons and <laughs> ran. <laughs> that was not the last time it was seen, though. About 15 or so years later, Two of my cousins were down in the woods. Uh, they had 
built a lean-to down there, and they were in pretty much the same area where we had had our sightings. And this was in an afternoon, and they saw, they said later, this entity, this whatever it was, apparition coming down the hill. Now, what was interesting is that my cousin Barry, who's Protestant, and this is important <laughs> to remember, he's Protestant, he saw a bell-shaped object coming down the hill. My other cousin, Russell, who's Catholic, saw the Virgin Mary coming down the hill. That, I thought, was very intriguing. Yes. It, it sort of implies that whatever this thing was, it sort of fed on your preconceived notions. I don't know. I, I can't, <laughs> again, I can't explain it. And a few years after that, my father was out in his tractor. He, had a, he used to do a lot of, not really farming, but he had a garden and he, you know, he'd take care of the property. So he was having his tractor one day, and he saw this white object fly over his head and over into the trees and the woods beyond. And he described it in much the same way as sort of this big amorphous shape. And that was back around 1990 or thereabouts. But there has been a more recent sighting of this thing. Hmm. The Kinder Blob has taken on a life of its own. There are a couple of websites actually dedicated to it believe it or not there's a blob blog <laughs> <laughs> and on the blog i found out that there were a couple of people two guys who saw it in 2017 and they described it almost exactly the same as the other people had uh, they said that first they heard a whistling sound when they looked overhead this big white blobby thing was flying over them and this was again somewhere around kinder oak i haven't been able to get these guys to respond to requests for interviews i have a feeling they're probably a little sheepish about it as many people might be mm -hmm. but i know their names and one of these days i'm going to talk to them directly and get their story firsthand but i just thought that was fascinating that the legend continues yeah this is one of my favorite entities that you cover in the book because it is just so strange and defies the typical categories we put these things in and that theme of looking at a strange entity and then it kind of morphing into something that jives with your religious convictions yeah is something we've heard before it's like the our lady of fatima sightings it's mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the glowing cross in the sky that people have seen. I don't know why it doesn't jive with other things that a person could be interested in. It always seems to come back to their religious beliefs for some reason. And it makes me think about that connection you mentioned about fairies and aliens. It's almost as if there was some kind of potentially an experiment done with Hollywood, with the deep state, CIA, whatever, military men, to kind of see what would happen, perhaps, if they spun some of these stories into a sci-fi lens. And then people, of course, they see these things, and then maybe they associate it with aliens. I don't know. I do think there's a continuum of these little green creatures from Ireland right on up to you know the sci-fi stuff we have today. But I could see an experiment being undergone where it's like, well, what if we color this through a, through a certain lens and then see if what people see starts to be things more of that type? I don't know. That's a, a an explanation that I know there's many, many stories that wouldn't fit into that mold, but it's something. I, I don't know. It's just weird. What do you make of that you think it's reading people's minds or do you think people's minds are trying to flip through what it knows? To, to find a box to put this thing in? You know, my gut feeling is it's the latter. I have no way of proving that, but... Did you ever read a book called Passport to Magonia by Jacques Vallée? Oh, yeah. A good one. A great yeah. one. Yeah, I should have known you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he postulates such interesting things in that book about, you know, the sort of cosmic joker that may exist that plays tricks on our 
puny human minds. <laughs> and that sort of leads into my theory about aliens and UFOs. It seems to me that they are, some of the things that they're accused of doing are so strange that I don't think extraterrestrial even covers it. It almost seems as if they're interdimensional or from another time or I don't know what, but and there does seem to be a connection with the the old fairy stories, which have so many parallels. I mean, it, it's hard to find anything in the old fairy abduction tales that you can't find in modern day alien abduction tales. So that to me indicates that it's the same phenomenon, but what that phenomenon is, I can't say for sure. Is it a phenomenon of the human mind or is it a phenomenon that's physical? but maybe not of our dimension. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> you know if anyone Charles does. Fort, Charles Fort used to say that I present the evidence here, and I'll make of it what you will. That's pretty much my attitude. <laughs> because I don't, I don't try to draw any foregone conclusions because I think once you've done that, then you kind of made up your mind. And you're not going to necessarily follow the evidence where it leads. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just kind of keep an open mind, then maybe you'll actually discover something totally new and unexpected. Yeah. So I, I like to keep that attitude. But I do find it very intriguing that these tales are so old and yet so current. Mm -hmm. And I mean, aliens are usually little, aren't they? They're usually about the size of a child or maybe a little larger, just like the fairies and the fairies used to abduct people and they would keep them in their fairy mounds or wherever they they went for maybe a, you know a week or two but when the person came out of the fairy mound they'd find that years and years had passed and it's quite similar to what happens to people with missing time it all goes kind of in a circle and i just I just state the facts, ma'am, and uh, <laughs> we'll take it from there. <laughs> yes, yes. I've even thought that it's interesting how the classic flying saucer, the dome, kind of has a mound shape to it, and mm -hmm. these fairies are supposed to be from the mounds. And also, you mentioned the missing time, just the similarities in the descriptions of the beings, mm -hmm. but also their behaviors and interests like you mentioned, stealing babies, abducting people. Yep. They seem to be really interested in our genetics or in mating or mm -hmm. in crossbreeding. And that's a curious thing. Yeah. And then if you want to, you know, get into some real wild conjecture, I mean, what if they're what if they're us from the future? You know, what if they are evolved human beings who have gone back in time to you know, try and help the race along because apparently the race is not doing so well in the future. And maybe that's why they're so interested in our reproductive selves. I don't know. You know, again, you can make all kinds of conjectures. There's no proof of any of it. But then again, there was no proof of evolution until Darwin. So fair. And I have this quote from the book about the genetic component to fairy stories. You write, the good people also had an exception, uh, had an obsession with human reproduction, stealing newborn human babies right out of their cradles and taking them to fairyland, exchanging them with fairy babies or sometimes with old and ugly fairies. The intention was to increase and improve their stock as, for whatever reason, fairy births were often blighted with miscarriages and deformities. As such, they would attempt to strengthen their breed with new blood, ours. Yep. And I do find some of that to just be the most interesting part, the strange genetic motivation. Maybe there's something about the ancient past and humanity's past that we just don't have context for that would explain some of this. Obviously, ancient aliens has just totally taken off, but the premise that maybe we were created in the ancient past or tinkered with, hmm. and that it, maybe these fairies were also created, but they weren't created as well or something. Yeah. But maybe there's a, a big secret in the ancient, ancient past that relates to some of this. It could be. 
you know, Charles Fort used to say, I believe that we are fished for. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that phrase. It's kind of creepy, but I yes. like it. We are property was another one of his phrases. Yeah, yeah. And that was long before alien abduction stories were around, modern alien abduction stories. So he was ahead of his time in that respect, in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. But just the fact that there are so many similarities to these tales. And I, I had an experience of my own, which is in the book, in which I saw something, some thing or someone uh, <laughs> digging in uh, what we call the back 40 of my grandparents' property, which is now our property, my wife and I. One day, I was I was probably in my early 20s. I was out wandering in the, the field in the back, which I was wont to do in those days. And bright, sunny day, and I happened to see at the edge of the woods, there was a guy with his back to me kind of a short person who happened to be dressed in green and he was digging, digging in the dirt for something. And I called out to the man and he didn't respond at all. It was as if he never heard me. And I called out to him a couple of times and he didn't respond at all. So I went back to the house, got my grandmother. She was very no nonsense and very, brave person she once chased three guys who were carrying guns off the property with a broom she just took a broom and chased them off they were hunting for deer i guess on our property but anyway she was that kind of person so she came out with me and we both called out to this man and at one point he sort of half turned around to face us but we couldn't see any features on his face and despite the fact it was a bright sunny day and then he just turned around as if we hadn't even been there and just went on digging. And then something even stranger happened. We decided to go back to the house. And to this day, I don't know why we did that. But what's really odd about this is that I don't recall actually walking back to the house. I just recall us being back at the house, sitting at the dining room table, and then and then one of us said to the other, why did we come back here? <laughs> and so we had no good answer for that. So we went out to see if the man was still there and he was gone. And there was no sign of anybody having dug there. That was one of the strangest things that ever happened to me. And I, I can't account for it. There might've been some missing time involved there. I'm not sure. <laughs> but whatever it was, it was really odd. And, I, you know, I had the feeling that we saw something we weren't supposed to see. Mm -hmm. And that somehow they got us back to the house so we couldn't see anymore. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Outside of the blob, that was my favorite story from the book. I read that. I knew we were going to have a good time. But as you say, he was entirely dressed in green, olive green shirt, olive green pants, olive green hat. Mm -hmm. That is such a common theme. And then also a lot of the stories I hear are with these little creatures digging. I don't know why, but often they're digging. Of course, you know, the leprechaun and the pot of gold and searching for some kind of treasure is in the mix of these stories. But that has to be one of like a couple dozen stories I've heard where someone stumbles upon a little man who is green or is dressed in green, who is digging and then notices that they're being seen and doesn't really care. It goes back to what they're doing. The blank slate, no features on the face is very strange. Mm. <laughs> that has got to be a creepy thing to see. Yeah. But yeah, I guess also this like fairy enchantment, the idea that, they just kind of wave you off and in some mind control spell, you just don't seem to care anymore. Like you said, maybe there's missing time. Who knows why you went back? But a lot of curiosity in that story. Yeah, that story has stuck with me for, well, about 50 years now, probably. And <laughs> I just, I still find it to be one of the strangest experiences I've ever had. It's unsettling because it makes you feel like maybe you're not entirely in control you know yes 
maybe there are other things that control us more than we know. Right. And some of this stuff also makes me think about the possibility that over the centuries, they have had a successful breeding program, and maybe some actually have learned to live among us, or they are able to maybe be hybridized in a way that if you're not really paying much attention, you won't notice. I actually have a good friend who thinks this is true. Through the grapevine, he met this guy who a female friend of his was dating, and this guy struck him as very weird. This guy said his family goes on these 10-day feasts out in the woods. This guy had money, but no job of any kind. There were also basic things about life that this guy seemed unfamiliar with. And when this girl had to meet this guy's mom, the mom was very obsessed with her genetics and asking questions that were way out of line for someone that you're just meeting. And my buddy also told me that if you really took a hard look at this guy's clothes, they were off. He noted that the shoes were certainly no brand he'd ever seen. And he asked the dude, hey, where'd you get these shoes? And the guy said he just got them secondhand somehow. Another sort of vague answer. Mm. And strangest of all, apparently this guy had a habit of putting his own stuff in people's food and drink. The example my buddy told me is that they were making a batch of coffee and this guy just went and added a powder. What he said was Herba Mate tea. Sure. Well, it's just a powder you happen to have. You call it Herba Mate. That's a common thing that makes it seem less weird, but it is weird. And, and everybody was like, whoa, man, we don't want yerba mate. We're trying to make coffee here. You should ask before you do something like that. And of course, that is a theme with these elves and fairies of the woods. It's a strange thing where they tend to really want you to eat something in these encounters a lot of the times. And mm -hmm. this is just a strange anecdote from a guy I have known since the third grade and I trust him a lot and he has no reason to, to lie about this. And uh, I don't know, but he just, because he looked at it with a little more skeptical of an eye, instead of just saying, this is a weird guy. He kind of thought, well, what if this isn't even a, a guy or what if this is like some kind of hybrid because he had all these odd things about his family and his past and where does the money come from? And what are you doing in these 10 day feasts out in the woods? Strange, <laughs> but maybe they're among us, man. Well, maybe that would explain it. <laughs> some people I know, <laughs> but yeah, who knows? I mean, it's as good a theory as any. And, and of course, that goes back to, you know, the, the Rip from Winkle story where Henry Hudson offered Rip, you know, a drink. And he just went into this reverie and fell asleep for 20 years. Right, right. So I don't know. No. And <laughs> I like when we can take a modern sighting and add context from the people who have lived in that landscape for many, many years. And with Native Americans, it's certainly true that they have pretty detailed descriptions of a wide range of beings that also tend to match other beings seen around the world. But there's a lot of that content in the book. Talk to us about some of these Native American stories and the categories of creatures they seem to see fairly often, enough to name them. Yeah. And it's interesting what they named them. They were called Pukwudgies, at least by the Iroquois. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting name, Pukwudgie. And Puck, of course, was a name used for fairies in the British Isles. Yeah. And, of course, Shakespeare used the name Puck in Midsummer Night's Dream. How odd that Native Americans would use part of the same word. That's true. <laughs> yeah, Pukwudgies were sort of diminutive people, much like the old world fairies would play tricks on people. And they behaved very much like the fairies that, or elves that you would find in Europe, and especially the ones in the British Isles and Ireland. They were notorious tricksters, and they also occasionally abducted human babies. So these legends are really universal. I mean, they, they appear in places as far flung as New Zealand and Japan. And you have to wonder, they must be based on something if these cultures that have never communicated with each other until recently have these old legends that go back thousands of years in some cases. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was William Michael Mott one time in, a, in an old interview. We were talking about fairy lore in the British Isles, and he made the case that if you were going to carry out some kind of genetics program with human beings in secret, you would want them to be on islands, separated from other places. And you mentioned New mm-hmm. Zealand. It just kind of stuck out to me. But of course, Native Americans, this is a real big island for any kind of yeah. like weird breeding program. But the fact that the majority of our lore does come from that Celtic region, I thought that was an interesting point. Yeah. I mean, for whatever reason, whenever people think of the little people, <laughs> they think of Ireland or Great Britain. but these legends are just as ubiquitous in Japan, especially, and the Far East, and so similar, so many parallels that it's hard to believe it's just coincidence. Mm-hmm. And going back to some of the stories that are your personal stories and your family's stories, you also note that your grandfather was a water witch or a dowser, to use mm-hmm. the less provocative term. But there might be some connection between natural springs that your grandfather tapped into and some of these creatures, both the kinderhook creature and the blob, if I'm not mistaken, not getting my wires crossed. But talk to us about that potential connection. Yeah, I mean, that's an old Native American legend. And actually, it's an old Celtic legend as well, that groundwater, especially underground water, has some connection to the paranormal. So way back in 1964, actually 63, we had a very bad drought in upstate New York. And my grandfather decided to do some dowsing. (laughs) He had done it before, I guess, when he was young. And apparently, I, I think his father had done it as well. And I had never seen it before. I was fascinated. I was about 11 years old. And he, uh, would take these two sticks and either sticks or sometimes he would use like a clothes hanger, a metal clothes hanger that he would twist in two shapes. And if these two sticks or whatever would meet in the middle, that's where the water was. And they they seemingly moved by themselves. It's kind of like the way a Ouija board works. And there was one point down in the woods where the sticks met (laughs) so he started digging for water there and sure enough water burst out all over the place and that's where that pond was that i was telling you about that my boyhood friend jumped over that's where that came from it was all underground water until my grandfather uncovered it and the connection (laughs) if there is one is that that's where the blob was seen. I mean, when my friend jumped over the the pond, he was running away from the blob. It's also very close to where the sound was that I heard in the woods, the one that scared my friend from England, in the almost exact same spot, Hmm. which is where the... Now we have a well that's much closer to the house. But back then, we just had a spring down in the woods. And it seemed like a lot of activity emanated from that area. It also wasn't far from where that man was digging. So (laughs) Hmm. maybe he was digging for water. Or (laughs) I I always thought if I could remember where the heck he was digging, I'd find a treasure and I could be rich. But alas, I can't remember exactly where it was. (laughs) Ah, is that a fairy spell? Yes, probably. (laughs) <laughs> Bruce, what a wild ride. Clearly, there are some weird things going on around the cat skills, and I salute you for getting it on the record. Kinderhook seems like a, an interesting little hotbed that I really didn't know much about. So I appreciate uh, everything you wrote about in this book, including your own experiences. If people want to dig deeper, get the book and learn about your other work, tell them how to do it. Well, they can go to Amazon. The name of the book is The Kinder Creature and Beyond, A Personal Reminiscence. You can buy it either on Amazon or you can get it directly from the publisher, which is Small Town Monsters. And they have a website, smalltownmonsters.com. And 
all the best bookstores, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> it was really good. It belongs on any high strangeness shelf. And thanks for talking to me today. We got outside of the parameters of the typical paranormal stuff, and that's what I go for. So thanks again, Excellent. and do take care. Well, thank you. And next time you're over in the East Coast, stop in. All right, bringing it in for a landing. Just some good fun for our heavy times. I personally do like these episodes about specific regional pockets of high strangeness. I like that we can just hear a bunch of odd stories that many of us probably haven't heard before. I like a guy who links fairies and aliens in his work. I know with two hours, the part of these shows that starts to sound the same as the whole, well, let's try to solve it thing. But I still enjoy the stories and getting various takes from new people about multiple dimensions or plasma portals. The Kinderhook Blob was a curious story, as was The Little Green Man, and the stuff in the second hour about the UFO flap was cool too. Flap is a weird word. I never really hear it in any other context other than UFO flap. There are no other flaps of any kind that I know of. I tend to say UFO spike, because flap just sounds weird. But anyway... I wanted this to come out before Christmas, but I just overestimated how much I could accomplish when Christmas festivities were at my place and my wife can't make a huge meal and watch a one-year-old. But the silver lining to all that is now I can mention that crazy UFO sighting in Vegas that happened. What was it, on the new moon the night before Christmas Eve, I think? I saw several videos of employees from the Sapphire Strip Club turning their phones to this cloud that clearly had something in it. It was a lot better sighting than some distant, hovering light. But again, it was in a cloud, so it makes me think Bluebeam because holograms and projections need a canvas like smoke or a cloud. But it was still pretty damn cool. I saw some people trying to say that it was probably just viral marketing for the strip club, and it's like, no. Marketing for a strip club is taking a van of girls in bikinis down to the strip, waving in a group of drunk dudes, and shuttling them to the club. It's a simple machine. (laughs) But people always try to find some rationale for the unexplained. It seems way more likely that the military would have tested their Blue Beam Space Brothers Are Coming technology in a very populated area. I mean, if we're going to cast doubt on it being a genuine sighting of a non-human piloted craft, then that's probably the direction I would take it. Then there was another weird story I just heard about, not as recent as the Vegas UFO, but this guy Andrew Dawson. He was a popular TikToker who, back in April in Canada, took a video of what looks like a giant person walking along the snowy mountaintop near what looks like a base or an outpost of some kind. He apparently tried to get closer and make some other videos trying to get a helicopter company to sponsor the situation and take him up there. And then he made a video about being stopped by a CIA agent who said he was trespassing. And then he made a couple more about being stalked by said agents. And then his second to last video was about being scared. And then it seems like his wife found him dead from a, quote, self-inflicted gunshot wound. And then I also heard from just the comments section that she was also recently found dead as well. So, really sad situation, but I do think his video looks like a giant. It had over 4 million views, too, so not a small thing. But just another odd story that fits in with this episode that I heard very recently. And tip to all you people out there, if you see something weird, and you upload it, and it goes viral, and the CIA says stop doing that, and then follows you around for a little while, I would probably just stop. But this episode also gave me the opportunity to mention my buddy's weird story about that guy who has family feasts in the woods and puts stuff in people's food and wears weird clothes. So this buddy of mine, his name is Kyle. He actually used to co-host this show with me like many, many years ago. And of course, he had some kind of psychotic break going down the child trafficking rabbit hole with Tracy Twyman a couple years ago. I'm sure a lot of you remember that thing that happened. 
But he ended up moving back to St. Louis, and he started a podcast with another guy that I've known since kindergarten, and they called it the Robot Polisher Podcast. If you see me on Twitter retweeting Robot Polisher tweets, well, that's my other friend's account. But they do a podcast together where they just smoke weed and bullshit about life and the news, and it's very raw. They go down a lot of rabbit holes, and it's a lot of the kind of stuff we like around here. But my buddy Kyle goes really in-depth with this story of the strange guy in an episode called Goblin Bread, if you are interested. It's his story, he can tell it, but I wanted to give you guys the gist because it is one of the more interesting things to have come out of their podcast because it's this odd personal story about maybe some type of being that is a hybrid or has integrated with humans a little bit. Kind of like a Men in Black encounter. A person could think nothing of it, but if you focus on the details and you're open to non-humans being among us, then this guy really set my buddy off. But it's just another random, interesting thing. Robot Polisher Podcast, the Goblin Bread episode. (laughs) But lots to like in this interview, and I'm so stuck on the stuff Dr. Greg Little talks about. I think shamanism and magic are heavily involved with a lot of these sightings. What even is magic besides altering consciousness and creating a ritual portal, which oftentimes does produce light, and I would argue if you captured that and put it in a bottle and examined it, you'd find plasma. I don't know about that last part, I've never summoned anything, but imagine the fairy folk are just really adept, natural magicians. They can play human consciousness like a piano or something. And in this long history of humanity, how many shamans could have opened up a portal and then this thing starts coming back to that same spot? Or if you don't close the ritual right, then it's out there in the world. So many things can happen, but there's a lot of overlap in these Venn diagrams, if you ask me. So big thanks to Bruce for doing the show and to Small Town Monsters for sending me the book and making this suggestion. I get way too many publishers sending me things to do every one, but this kind of just had enough that I thought it would work, and you be the judge, I guess. In the second hour, we talked about other odd Native American trickster beans, water, plasma, and electromagnetism, UFO flaps, and the Westchester wing, UFOs, nukes, and water, the best film depictions of UFOs, Poe Pictures, Whitley Strieber, Entities, and Death, the case of the missing coleus plant, the mysterious events of September 11th, 1985, the pine bush abductions, the Margaret Mayer entity, and the Montauk monster. We really let it rip. Become a Plus member, stop missing half the show, and take part in the reciprocation that's needed for truly independent, sponsor-free media. Just click the link right at the top of the show notes and start the seven-day free trial. Let's go! (laughs) That said, one more show to end the year, and it is a doozy. So brace yourself, we are turning the conspiracy dial up to 11. And until then, enjoy the rest of the holidays. I will talk to you soon. For now, I'm getting out of here. Your move, Kinderhook Creature, Kinderhook Blob, and other beans of the New England area. Your fucking move. When you see weird lights outside of your door Something sits on your chest when you sleep It might be a pattern you've been through before Mm-hmm. Oh, you might have those screen memories Darling, wait till we get some proof Still we'll make them see And baby, I try the camera
on cause my memories fade But we know that it's not just a dream Cause they never put me back exactly the same way is another show complete. Remember, as much as you enjoyed this, which is just the free first hour, I hope you'll become a Plus member to hear the full two-hour interviews. You also can engage with other Plus members in the comments and the forums, and you'll find your answer to one of the most common questions I get, which is where can I find those cover songs that you use at the end of the show? Well, they are free downloads for Plus members too. And without Plus members, I can't hire the occasional musician to bring these odd cover song ideas to fruition. Plus members are how I'm able to do what I do without ads and without the big machine being on my back. We can fit so much more into a two-hour interview, and I do my best to make it worth your time and money. The conversation only gets deeper, weirder, and more controversial in that private hour. How could it not the way things are going? But the best way to sign up is at thehiresidechats.com where new first time subscribers always get a free seven day trial because I'm just that confident. There's no PayPal on the website, but if you need to use PayPal, then sign up through Patreon and you get all the same episodes. Our website is a credit or debit system, but you can also scope out the other options like a few various cryptos, cash or check mailed to the PO box. And I'll even barter with most people if you have your own business and produce something nice that my wife or kid or taste buds might like. But the architects of consensus reality have made it clear that these themes and topics aren't really welcome on the main stage. And so this is how we secure a little counterculture corner for ourselves. And I hope you'll join plus because that is the only way it works. Besides, you can cancel anytime right on your profile page. The most common concern I hear is people just being unsure if THC Plus will work with their podcast app, and the answer is probably yes. But if not, we have several high-level app recommendations for whatever phone you use, and the website is made for mobile too. We're trained to tip a waitress for bringing us a sandwich, but that tip doesn't give you access to a second sandwich. 
Really, I'm not asking for any more than that, and I think I offer a better service. Come get your second serving of tasty conspiracy goodness in exchange for that small token of your appreciation. Beyond that, let it also be known that we have grown and survived as long as we have by word of mouth. I don't care so much about social media likes or follows, but tell the right people about THC. And not just listeners, but the high-level figures who are better suited to sit down with me than most other hosts. And if you can help me with any of these things, I can work to bring you better shows, which is just a win-win for both of us. Informative, entertaining, and action-packed. It also never hurts to thank a guest you liked if you have the time either. We want them to know people are listening, so they're willing to come back down the road too. Thank you for spending some time with me, and cheers to a better tomorrow.